My name is Lindsay Tyndall, and our topic for today is getting organized. And that includes organizing your technology space, all the papers that you may receive or have around your house, and your physical space. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type it into the Q&A box and someone will be able to answer your questions there. We are proud to offer this series in partnership with the Los Angeles Public Library. And this series is also through Triage Health, which is a program of our larger organization, Triage Cancer. And Triage Health provides free education on the legal and practical issues to help people navigate healthcare. And we do this through resources, materials, and events. This can be especially important when someone's navigating a chronic or serious medical condition, but many of these issues impact everyone, whether you have a serious medical condition or not. So through triagehealth.org, we have a number of resources like quick guides, checklists, webinars, animated videos, and worksheets. So jumping into our topic for today, everywhere you look, there seems to be some type of advice on how to declutter and how to get organized. In fact, there are people who have made millions trying to help people get organized. But when we really stop to think about it, these tend to be somewhat generic tips and tricks. And it got us thinking, do things actually change? Do recommendations change around getting organized after someone has been diagnosed with a serious medical condition? Do we need to consider different strategies in those situations? And we landed on the answer, yes. And that's not just about being organized or having pretty drawers or closets or having your bookshelf alphabetized. It's actually very functional and necessary for people to keep organized, especially when there's been a diagnosis like cancer or dementia or diabetes. But it may feel much more overwhelming. Organizing is hard for everyone. Literally, if you type getting organized into Google, you get half a billion results back. And then there are a ton of resources out there. So why did we think it was necessary to have this webinar? One reason is that none of the existing resources talk about organizing in a well-rounded way. You can find resources on organizing your finances, another one about organizing your space, or another one about organizing your schedule. But nothing that we found really addressed that people might be coming to this challenge of organizing from a place where they're not 100% themselves. They could be struggling physically as a result of their diagnosis or side effects from a treatment. And there's also the mental component. There's a stress and anxiety component to being diagnosed and going through treatment. And that can make something that would seem like an otherwise ordinary everyday task that much more difficult. So life is busy and now there's a diagnosis and now there are all these things that you need to consider and on top of that, we're asking people to be organized. It can feel too much and it can feel like an information overload. Which is why preparation is key. When we think about why it's so important to be organized, there are a few things to keep in mind. You need to be able to get what you need and get the help that you need. And sometimes in order for that to happen, you've got to be organized. There have also been a ton of studies that show that being organized can actually decrease your stress and that decrease in stress has physical health benefits to it. So a decrease in stress could help support your immune system, which of course is going to be important when you're in the middle of treatment for a serious medical condition. But I also think it can be emotionally helpful. This is a time when many people feel out of control. They don't have control over what treatments might be available or control over what's happening inside your own body. But getting organized is a physical way to regain some of that control and to hopefully empower you. 
There are also financial reasons why people need to be organized, and there are some reasons around protecting your loved ones. Now, when we talk about getting organized, there are a number of different places and buckets of organization that you may need to think about. So this is a list of some of the places where we need to think, and this is just a starting point. So whether that's your home or your workspace or your finances, these are all different areas where organization could be helpful. But of course, none of this is one size fits all. I recognize that everyone here today is coming at this from a different place. Maybe you're in the middle of treatment and you're just trying to keep your head above water. Maybe you're coming out of active treatment and trying to get back on track. Or maybe you're just trying to be proactive. And I also realize that some of the suggestions that we'll make today may not make sense for you. Maybe they cost money that you can't afford to spend right now, or they require using technology at a level that you may not feel comfortable with. So I'm going to do my best to give multiple solutions or suggestions, and hopefully something is the right fit for you. Now, I completely understand that some people don't feel as comfortable with technology as others. Some of us have grown up with it and have access to things like computers and smartphones for most of our lives. And some of us spent most of our lives without these types of technology. I also recognize that there is a great digital divide in terms of access in this country. And unfortunately, I don't have a solution for that. But for those that do have access to a computer or even a smartphone, there are some really useful tools that can help you with organizing. That might be email, file storage, or electronic calendars, for example. And now there's so much information that's only available online. Like your hospital system might have an online portal to communicate with your providers. If you try to sign up for a My Social Security account with the Social Security Administration, that requires you to have an email. You may also be required to have an email to do things like sign up for health insurance. So signing up for a free email can be very valuable. And I do wanna recognize that it may be free to make an email account like on Yahoo or Gmail, but accessing the internet and accessing a computer is not always free. The good news is, is that there are places that you can go for access. You might be able to go to the local library, which I'll talk more about in just a moment, but there are also other options. Maybe you could use a friend's computer or use one at a local community center or a religious center. There are also programs to help people get computers and phones. So Goodwill has a recycling program that can help people get computers. There's something called the Lifeline Assistance Program, which is a federal government initiative that provides free phone service, including monthly minutes and texts to income qualifying elderly people. There's the Affordable Connectivity Program, which can help people get free or low cost internet access. And there may, may be local nonprofits that can help. But coming back to the library, the library can be a really great resource for you to be able to access the internet or access a computer if you don't have access at home. So the Los Angeles Public Library is one of those libraries where you can do this. If you have a library card, which is free, you can reserve a computer up to five days in advance for up to two hours per day at an LA Public Library branch. If you don't have a library card and you don't wanna get one, you can still use a free walk-up internet access computer for up to 15 minutes a day at an LA Public Library branch, which if you get something like email, you could use that time to check your email. And while I've said so far that we recommend getting email so you can do things like sign up for my social security accounts or use the portal for your doctors um, to communicate with your providers, there are some downsides. Um, the main one is definitely junk mail. 
So if you're someone who's already feeling overwhelmed and that there's too much clutter in your life and that you're missing the important things, getting a hundred junk emails in your inbox every day just adds to that. But fortunately, there are some strategies that we can use to help deal with that. So there's a service called unroll.me where when you sign up, It looks through your inbox for digital newsletters and other types of emails that maybe you've been receiving but haven't really been opening and just been deleting. And it gives you a really simple way to pick which ones you want to stay on and which ones you want to get rid of. So instead of having to go through your inbox and hit unsubscribe for each different chain email that you're receiving, it can be a much faster process. Another option is that some people will get two email addresses. So maybe they use one for things like doing their online shopping and signing up for a loyalty program. Or if you're signing up for a newsletter that you may or may not wanna actually read. And then you make a separate email account And you only use that one for the important things like your doctor portal or the social security administration or your bills. So if there's a day where you're feeling totally overwhelmed, you don't even have to log into that first email address. You just log into the account that has the important things. Now, we also have a problem with junk snail mail. It's honestly shocking how much I get that just goes into the trash can and how quickly they manage to find you when you move to a new place. And unfortunately, there aren't as easy as solutions as there are with email. But there is a website called the Direct Marketing Association Consumer Website. And if you log on to this, you can opt out of things like catalogs and credit card offers and insurance offers. There is a small cost. So you do have to pay $4 to opt out of these mailing lists, but then that opt out lasts for 10 years. But let's say you don't do that or you do that, but you're still getting a lot of things coming in your mailbox. You may want to use the never put it down strategy. And it works like this. You walk to your mailbox, you get the mail, and you walk over to where your trash can or your recycling bin is. And while you're standing there, you look at each piece of mail and decide whether you want to keep it or trash it. If it's trash, it goes straight into the trash can. If you decide to keep it, you open it up, trash anything that's extra. So if there's an extra blurb or piece of paper or some sort of advertisement that came in with that particular piece of mail, you just throw those pieces away right away. Maybe it's a bill that you got a return address envelope with, but you're going to pay the bill online and you're never going to use the envelope. So you just throw it away and that's the end of that. And then in hopefully less than five minutes, you now only have a few pieces of mail that you know exactly what you need to do with. So what should you do with it? I think having a spot in your home that you can then quickly file that mail away can be really helpful. And a filing box is just an example of something you could use that you divide into maybe three or four categories. So if it's a bill, it goes in the to pay category. And if it's something that you need to respond to, like an invite to something, it goes in an I need to deal with this later pile. And so you figure out what categories work for you And then the mail either goes from the mailbox into either the trash or into a file. Another strategy, if it's something that you can deal with immediately, like you're just gonna log on and pay your bill right then and there, then you could potentially even scan the hard copy and throw it away, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. But the idea here, is that you're never giving your mail the opportunity to pile up and it's never taking more brain space than that first five minutes where you're dealing with it. And then the only thing that you have to come back to are the really important things that you've made the choice that you either want to deal with or recognize that you have to deal with. 
So looking at this slide, the desk here on the right of the screen is an example of a terrible organization system. And this is what happens when you walk from the mailbox and you put it on the counter. And then the next day you walk to your mailbox and you put your mail on the counter. This is what it ends up looking like. And we want to avoid that because I don't know about you, but looking at that makes me feel stressed. And there could be important things in there that you're missing. So creating an organizational system can be really important. I've mentioned a file folder or a file box, but maybe you're someone that prefers to use a three ring binder, if that makes sense to you, or maybe you wanna use electronic files. There are also some, some pre-built planners that are specific to different medical diagnoses, um, like there's one for cancer, or one for diabetes. Um, Manta Cares, who's one of our partners, also makes a planner for those with cancer and a notebook for those with complex medical conditions. And now most of these pre-built planners do have a cost associated with them, but if you think it's something that may work well for you, it may be worth it. And sometimes when we talk to people about organizing, they'll ask, what do I think is better? And the honest answer there is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's best for me or what works for me because we're all different. And one of these systems is not better than the other. It's what matters most is that the system makes sense to you and makes sense in your life. And it's also about what system you're going to stick with. Because again, this is not a one size fits all situation. I will say, if you are interested in hearing more about dealing with documents and getting organized around paper, we have two um, previous webinars on the Triage Cancer website that were given by a certified professional organizer, which may be helpful to you. We also have a spreadsheet available on our website that you can download and input your own information and it can help you track your medical bills. So in this spreadsheet, you can put in information like your health, about your health insurance, like your deductible or your out-of-pocket maximum. And then you can put in the information for each bill that you're receiving. And the spreadsheet will help you keep track of this information and help make sure you aren't missing or forgetting about something. And it also can help you calculate how much you have left to meet your deductible and how much more you have to pay to reach your out-of-pocket maximum, which can be really helpful numbers to know when you're planning ahead with your care. But dealing with finances in the middle of treatment or when you're experiencing side effects can be very difficult. There are some things that might be useful to consider. So many credit card companies, mortgage companies, utility companies have an option for automatic billing. So if you sign up, you can avoid having to worry about if your bills are being paid and if they're being paid on time. Another option that you may consider is using your bank's online bill pay system. You still have to go in and manually schedule the bills, but this way, you don't have to deal with the extra steps of mailing the payments in or trying to keep track of what's been sent out or having to log on to five different companies' websites to pay your bill. There's also a record of when something's getting paid. But maybe you want to consider using a bill spreadsheet. Down one side, you would put all the bills that you have to pay for that month. And then across the top, you put each month of the year. So every month when you open the document and you put in what you've paid, then it's very easy to see if there's an empty spot for a missed bill. And if you're, someone is really struggling with, with their finances and managing their finances, they may wanna think about appointing a power of attorney for financial affairs. A power of attorney for financial affairs is an agent who would have the ability to make financial decisions for somebody. It's an estate planning tool. And while this isn't something we're going to talk much about today, please know 
that we have a ton of estate planning resources on our website, and we'll be talking about estate planning in next week's session. It's also good practice to keep records of things like your medical bills, payments that you make, your explanations of benefits, pre-authorizations, meals, travel costs, et cetera. You wanna make sure to keep track of these expenses and mention them to your tax preparer if you have one, because some of these expenses may actually be tax deductible. You'll also wanna keep records of these expenses for a minimum of three years in the event that you're audited by the IRS. But to be on the safe side, you may consider keeping them for six years. Speaking of taxes, usually tax day is April 15th, and there are a lot of different ways that someone can file their taxes. Now, some people don't actually earn enough money to be required to file taxes, but for those who do need to file taxes, there are some resources out there to help. Maybe it's hiring someone like an accountant or using one of the online tax prep services, or maybe you're confident in doing them yourself. There's also free help that may be available to you. So that may be the Taxpayer Advocate Service or the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. But Regardless of whether you file taxes or not, you're likely to get a lot of papers, whether that's mail or bills or receipts or insurance information or other important documents. And that's where a filing system is going to be very useful. This might be a hard copy filing box or filing cabinet that you use. And again, this isn't going to be a one size fits all situation. And there's nothing wrong with keeping the hard copies, but here's the thing. If you choose to keep hard copies in a file cabinet, it's important that you set aside time every so often to clean these files out. So maybe you want to clean them out once a year before the start of the new year, or maybe you have kids in school, so you want to do it right before school starts or right at the end of the school year, clean out everything to prepare for the new school year. When you choose to do that, to clean out those files, is about what when works best for you. It doesn't particularly matter what time of year that you choose to do it. But I mentioned earlier that you should be keeping these records for three years. So where should you be keeping them? How should you be keeping them? Do they have to be in a drawer next to you? I think this could also be helpful to think about in terms of archives. So maybe you have a box, you know, that's just for your taxes. And again, every year you go in, you put the new stuff in and you take the old stuff out. There's still going to be a lot of physical paper. So as an alternative, you may want to digitize. Now, that could include a physical scanner. And to give an idea of what scanners cost nowadays, the long skinny one on the top is about $50 and the one below was about $300. So there's really a range when it comes to purchasing a scanner, but it's much more accessible than it once was. But I don't know about you, I don't particularly want another machine in my house. I don't know where I'd put it. Um, or maybe you can't afford it. So another option is that there are a whole category of apps that you can use on your mobile device, whether that's a phone or a tablet, and you can use them to scan your documents. So what you do is you take a picture of the document and the app converts it into a PDF, which is a savable document. Two examples of these apps are Jotnot and Adobe Scan, and these are both free apps that you can download to both Apple and Android devices. And they can be incredibly useful. In fact, we use them all the time at Triage Cancer. Another option on the iPhone is the built-in app called Notes that lets you scan documents there as well. But once you've taken a picture of a document or you've scanned it, what do you do with it next? One option 
would be to save it to the cloud. And so all of these scanners and apps can be connected to your cloud service of choice. So maybe that's Google Drive or iCloud or Dropbox. But there are plenty of people who don't feel comfortable putting that kind of information on the cloud. And some people would prefer to save it to a physical device like a computer, which is totally fine. There are pros and cons to both. But if you are saving it to computer, there are some challenges to think about. If you get a new computer or your computer crashes, that may be an issue. You also only have so much space on your hard drive on your computer. But on the other side, it is going to be a bit more protected than the cloud. So when we talk about saving all of these files onto the computer, just like everywhere else in our lives, someone's computer can be a place where clutter manifests. So one way to avoid that is to use folders. And sometimes that means folders inside of folders inside of folders. So here's an example of how you might organize your bills into different categories based on the type of bills. So we have the main folder, which is bills, and then that's broken down into house bills, medical bills, and student loans. Now, when we go into that medical bills file, we can then see the information about the different bills that we have related to our medical expenses. So you may want to label them with the, the date of service and maybe who the provider was, um, just for your own reference. It may also be helpful to include the medical bills tracker worksheet. And it may be helpful to separate them out by year so that you can have all your medical expenses for one year in one file together. Another place where we see people struggle with organization is in their home. And one of the ways that we can see that is by the number of home organization shows and books and movies and things like how big the organization section is at places like Target or Walmart. Many people aim to be more organized, and I can certainly understand why. If we look at the pictures of these two rooms, one environment seems a bit more calm and helpful to improving someone's health. The one on the left is a little bit more chaotic. It may be unsanitary, that's un unclear. But the one on the right is more calm, more organized, and isn't very stressful to look at. So when we talk about things like getting organized at home, there are a ton of resources out there. But one thing you may wanna consider is that in addition to organizing and making your house cleaner, there may be an added benefit that could potentially be a source of income. So when people come to us and they talk about needing financial assistance and they haven't been able to find any for whatever reason, Sometimes they're able to look within their own home and find sources of income that they may not have thought about before. So this list is just some examples. It's definitely not an exhaustive list of all the things to think about. So for example, maybe you have your wedding dress hanging in a closet. It's been there for decades. And maybe you've been divorced. You might consider selling that wedding dress or selling old furniture that you have sitting around, or old musical instruments, or books, or baby gear. And there's a lot of different ways that we can actually sell things. And many of those are much safer than some of the older systems might have been. Now, when we think about practical tips of getting organized, there are some things that you may need to do or adjust in your day-to-day -to, -day to get organized. Because of course, life continues to occur and you need to do things like eat and run errands and do yard work and shovel the snow, whatever it may be. And there are tools out there that can be useful that exist for you to tap in and get help. Another thing that we hear sometimes is that there aren't any loved ones or caregivers that are physically nearby. So how can they be helpful? They can't bring me a meal. They can't drive me to my appointments. But 
thanks to technology, we do have some options for people to be able to help us remotely. So maybe you have a caregiver who lives across the country and they can do something like order your groceries to get delivered to you and they can do that all online. So it doesn't matter that you're in California and they're in New York, for example, they could help you by getting those groceries delivered. Another common concern that we hear from people is around childcare. So whether that's needing a babysitter or help getting a child to and from school or extracurricular activities, with a medical diagnosis and appointments, that can get even harder than it normally is. There are some professional services out there like Sitter City or Mommy, which connects people for shared childcare. Or maybe you want to consider looking locally. So are there local students that you could pay? There's a ton of Facebook groups out there for nannies. There's a tool that's sort of like Uber, but for carpooling for your kids. Maybe it's thinking about your neighbors. So is there someone on your block that doesn't work that's maybe willing to sit with your child for a while? I know in my life, after my siblings and I were all grown, my mom missed being able to get on the floor and hold babies or play with toddlers. So when one of her neighbors asked for help with her kids so that she could go to an appointment, my mom was thrilled. And so was my neighbor because now someone was there to help her. But you may be in a situation where you're new to your neighborhood. Maybe you don't know your neighbors or you don't feel comfortable asking them. So think about the other people that are in your life. Maybe you're part of a faith group or a book club and you have people there that might be able to help. The idea here is that we're looking outside of the traditional sources for childcare. So th those are some ways to enlist help, but sometimes that can be easier said than done. In fact, to effectively be helped, it may be necessary to do some things on your end. So having all of the information in a central location can be critical when you have multiple people involved in different aspects of your life. This could be about a caregiver helping you with your medical needs, like getting to an appointment or taking your medication. It could also be about arranging a carpool with friends or helping your children be more independent with things. So it's just one last thing to try and keep in your brain. It can also take a lot of energy, both physical and mental, to keep the people that you love up to date with what's going on. So maybe you want to create a shared calendar so that people don't have to text you to see when your next appointment is. They can just look on the calendar. Or maybe you want to use a group text message thread so that instead of having to individually send a bunch of different text messages to update people, you can send one text and update everybody at once. Another thing that can take a lot of brain power is making sure you have what you need when you need it, especially if you're in and out of the house at doctor's appointments. So one suggestion is that you keep a go bag. This term originates from the military where they always have their pack ready to go, but I think it can be really useful for most people as well. So what would you keep in your go bag? That totally depends on you and your needs, but here are some examples. You may want a copy of your insurance card, any medical records, a list of medication, maybe snacks or a water bottle, maybe something like a um, travel blanket. What you keep in your go bag is up to you and whatever suits your needs best. But when you're off to something like a doctor's appointment, you don't have to take the time to think, do I have everything I need and go through that mental checklist to make sure you have it all because it's all right there, ready to go in your go bag. But sometimes being prepared isn't necessarily about the things, having the things that you need with you, but it's about making sure that you have the right information with you. 
And that can be especially helpful in the case of an emergency. So some people might wear one of those medical bracelets that could inform any first responder or bystander of their medical condition if something were to happen to them in a public place. It could include information like your name, your diagnosis, an emergency contact number, maybe what medication you're on, all information that could be helpful for a first responder to know. Another option is in your smartphone. And this can be either in an iPhone or an Android device, but I personally am an iPhone person, so I'm going to kind of go through this scenario with you. So if I experienced a medical emergency in public and I was not able to communicate things like my name or my medical condition, an option for a first responder or a bystander, if they pick up my phone and they hold on to the power button and the sound button at the same time, it'll bring you to a screen where you can select my medical ID. In my medical idea, ID, sorry, it has things like my name, some health information. So you can put allergies in there, medical conditions, medications. It lets medical personnel know that I'm an organ donor. And it has the contact information for my emergency contacts. And so this exists on the iPhone, but maybe you're an Apple Watch wearer or another type of smart watch. A lot of times you can put that into your smartwatch as well as another option for people to look at for this information. And this is all information that could be really helpful for someone to know, like an EMT or the emergency room doctors, if you're in an emergency medical situation. And while that's all really helpful for an emergency, what about medical information in everyday settings? One suggestion is keeping an email file in your email that's just for medical related issues. And everything that you get can be filed away into that file. It can be really helpful to ask if you're getting a test done to have test results sent to you personally, as well as to your provider. And then any communications that you have electronically can all get put into that medical file. Another really great tip is that some people will have in their email, for example, something that tells all their medications, supplements, vitamins that they're taking and put that list in their email and include things like their dosages, contact information for their providers, because most of us have smartphones that we can use to access our email and we carry that around with us. So if we're sitting in a provider's office and they ask, what medications are you taking? Instead of having to go through that mental math and figure out all of what you're taking, it's very easy to just pull out your phone, look at that email and read it right there to your provider. It can also be really helpful if someone uses an electronic calendar to use the notes section for questions. So I don't know about you, but I know with me, when I know that I have a doctor's appointment coming up, I have a million questions in my head in the days ahead of, uh, in the days before the appointment to ask the doctor. I get all of these questions in my head. And then as soon as I sit down in the room with the doctor, it's like my mind goes blank. I forget everything that I'm supposed to ask. So one suggestion, is that you put those questions in the note section. As soon as you, you think of it, you just type it into your phone so that when you're sitting there with the doctor, you're able to pull that up and you have all of those questions that you had ready to go. I also think it's really helpful to take a picture on your phone of your insurance card, both front and back. So if you're ever in a situation where you get to the doctor's office and you realize you've forgotten your insurance card, that you at least have something that has proof of your insurance. Some of these things may sound super obvious or run of the mill, but what our goal is today is to provide some practical tips to make this whole process seem just a little less overwhelming for people.
You may also have tools that automatically track information that could be useful to you or your providers. So maybe you wear an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or some other type of smartwatch, and you can program that to remind you to do things like take your medication or drink more water or get something to eat. It can also track your exercise or your movement or your heart rate, all information that could be helpful for you or your provider to know. Now, I realize that was a lot in a short period of time and it may feel a bit overwhelming, but just remember that like most things in life, being successful at this may take some time and some practice. You may not get this all done this week, this month, even this year, but asking the questions and getting the help where it's needed is definitely a step in the right direction to getting organized. This is also a reminder that it does not have to be perfect. Your home does not need to look like it belongs in a magazine. I know mine certainly doesn't. And some days it may be harder than others to stay on top of things. So that's really about finding a system that works for you and making your best effort, whatever that looks like on a particular day to stay organized. And what are some tangible next steps that we may consider? You may wanna start by thinking about the sources of clutter and writing those sources down. And then look at each of those sources and think about what makes the most sense to you. Maybe you think a physical file box is gonna be best or maybe you wanna scan things in and keep files digitally. Once you've determined what system will work best for you, you think about what tools you need to complete that system. So maybe you need to go out and buy a file box or you need to download an app on your phone to scan documents. And we really recommend focusing on one system at a time. It may be that you feel like, oh, I wanna just get this all done, but you may be setting yourself up for failure if you're not able to handle all of that at once. So if we focus on one system at a time, and once we get that one system down, then moving on to the next is really the best way to go about implementing this into your life. This is also a reminder that sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. So a perfect example of this happened just the other weekend when I was cleaning out a closet in my house. And in order to clean that closet out, I took everything out of that closet and just on the floor all around me. So the area looked like an absolute disaster. But once I finished cleaning the inside and I put everything back in the place it was supposed to go, the area inside the closet was organized and so was the area around it. It just took some time and a little bit of mess before we reached that point of organization. You may also want to consider getting help from family members or friends. And lastly, and I think most importantly, is not to get discouraged. If something isn't working how you wanted, make adjustments. Don't abandon your efforts entirely. Think about how you could adjust your system or your efforts in order for that organizational system to work better for you. Now that concludes the substantive portion of our webinar today. I invite you to join us for the final session, which is exactly a week from today on February 12th at 12 p.m. Pacific, where we'll be talking about more about getting organized for estate planning and being prepared. I do also wanna let you know about our upcoming webinars with Triage Health. So our next one is on April 30th, and you can register for that on our website at triagehealth.org slash webinars. And lastly, I do want to mention a bit more about our legal and financial navigation program. So with this program, you can fill out an intake form on our website and schedule a free one-on-one -on -one call with one of our staff attorneys. And on this call, you'll be able to ask questions specific to your situation, and the staff attorney can help explain what options may be available to you 
and talk to you about what next steps you may be able to take.